Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. And on behalf of Duke Margolis, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar on combating rising antimicrobial resistance, advancing public health preparedness, antibiotics, and innovation. We've got 90 minutes, and we'd like to use that time to review the status and outlook for addressing drug-resistant infections. This issue is not new, but it is timely. The public health threat related to antimicrobial resistance continues to rise, and several companies that have developed new antibiotics have been unable to sustain them on the market, and pharmaceutical investment in this space is struggling. There are some important recent developments related to this global public health challenge that we're going to hear more about today. In the United States, the United Kingdom, and other countries, policymakers are considering and developing better ways to pay for priority drugs for resistant organisms, moving away from paying for important antibiotics on a per-use fee-for-service basis, which hasn't provided appropriate rewards for development or appropriate incentives for use toward more subscription-like payment models that de-link payments from the volume of services and link those payments to their value for health protection. For more details on these models, please take a look at some of the Duke Margolis publications uh, on the topic, which are linked into uh, this event. Drugs for infectious disease threats are about protecting population health, and that's where individual fee-for-service payment doesn't work well. In this pandemic, we've relied on substantial population-based advanced purchase contracts to make sure we develop and, and have available the COVID countermeasures we need more effectively than a fee-for-service model would work. Similar principles apply to combating resistant infections. Everyone benefits, particularly those who never get infected when we use a population focused approach. We'll also consider today how recent developments to increase US and global public health preparedness have created some opportunities to ease the burden of commercializing and sustaining novel antibiotics. We'll consider developments in novel antimicrobial platforms, robust and innovative approaches to manufacturing, better diagnostics, and other capabilities that have received greater attention as part of the pandemic response. Response. So uh, on our agenda, I think that the next slide, uh, we're pleased to have a conversation uh, coming up with, uh, with Senator Michael Bennett, who's been a leader on issues related to public health preparedness and um, resistant um, infections. After that, we're going to discuss how the U.S. can lead policy approaches to combat antimicrobial resistance through uh, a range of legislative proposals and opportunities for coordination with partners around the world. And finally, we'll talk about preparedness for future pandemics and public health threats and the lessons learned from uh, the, the COVID pandemic that might be helpful in combating antimicrobial resistance and developing new technologies to address emerging infectious diseases. Throughout the event, we hope that you'll ask questions, make comments, please use the Q&A function in Zoom for that. And you're welcome to submit those questions and comments at any time. Right now, we're gonna get going. I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, my colleague, former FDA Commissioner, Scott Gottlieb. Scott, great to have you with us this morning. You've talked about uh, why this year might be different uh, when it comes to infectious disease threats uh, with more attention from policymakers to address uh, these kinds of infections through subscription models, uh, which in turn could drive more innovation here to support preparedness uh, uh, in, uh, um, for uh, biologic threats as well as other conditions. Uh, maybe you could kick us off with your thoughts about uh, this topic and why it's timely and maybe different right now. Yeah, and thanks for having me, Mark. I apologize for my poor bandwidth uh, today. I'm coming from Washington, D.C. Uh, I do think that the, um, the landscape is different for trying to do something definitive when it comes to antimicrobial resistance and some of the path pathogens that we're seeing emerge. I think we need to start as we think about pandemic preparedness and preparedness against um, new pathogens, novel pathogens that can threaten us in more significant ways, we need to start with uh, the framework of what are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to achieve better preparedness so that when something emerges in the future, we're better equipped to try to mitigate it and deal with it? Or are we, are we trying to prevent something that emerges in the future from actually having a devastating impact in the first place and getting a grip on society and being able to lead to an outbreak or certainly lead to the next pandemic? And I think it's the latter. And if you if you think about that question um, and you, you focus on the second um, the second sort of option, um, the second outcome, it leads you to different policy efforts. Um, you know, we, we think about the next pandemic being a novel virus. We think about RNA viruses because they mutate rapidly. And we think about viruses that pri primarily that spread through um, respiratory droplets or aerosols because 
an RNA virus that spreads through respiration has these sort of characteristics that can lead to a pandemic on the scale of what we're seeing right now. Coronavirus falls into that, um, that group. Uh, influenza does, measles does. There's other viruses that fall within that group. But we also have to think about uh, antimicrobial resistant organisms and bacteria as well, because uh, uh, something that threatens us on this scale or something even approximating this scale doesn't need to be something that spreads rapidly through society and implicates a lot of people. It could be something that's very fearsome that's spreading in the community that creates a pervasive risk that really starts to change our behavior. You know, when you when you have outbreaks of multi-drug resistant staff in communities where ordinary infections suddenly turn into extraordinary infections and life-threatening infections, even from you know routine injuries in a community, when you see those kinds of outbreaks, and we've seen them, uh, that really starts to change behavior in those communities. And you think about kids being uh, you know, susceptible to those kinds of organisms. And it could be a case where we start to see these things become much more commonplace, where we see outbreaks of multidrug resistant organisms where people are coming in with community acquired infections that are very hard to treat and deadly. And I think if we start to see that on a wider scale, that can have a really profound impact on society on how we behave. And so we need to think about those kinds of risks. I think that the science is improving a lot, but coming up with novel uh, ways of attacking these organisms. You know, for years, we've seen a lot of the anti-infective development, anti-fungal development be sort of new iterations on old mechanisms. And it really wasn't a, a lot of brand new novel mechanisms that were being put into development. That's changing when you look at the early pipeline, even some of the late pipeline, you're seeing um, brand new approaches to how we're gonna to try to address uh, bacteria and, and funguses and not just sort of, you know, a new iteration of an existing compound. What's really holding this back is what you touched on, Mark. Uh, you know, when I look at this from the standpoint of, you know, the venture capital community, this is not an easy space to invest in, uh, in terms of the development costs and the expected returns on the investments. And we can try to solve some of that through grants and through prizes. Um, and I think that there's a place for those kinds of remedies, but I think ultimately we need to come up with a different business model. And the idea of trying to create a subscription-based model where instead of paying on a per-use basis for an antibiotic that you really want to have as an insurance policy, you can conceive of institutions where a lot of these drugs are going to get used, paying an annualized subscription to have access to a certain number of doses of a drug uh, to treat a given population, and then they become stewards of the drug. They ha don't have an incentive to use more or use less. Um, but they have an incentive to continue to provide good stewardship. That provides a stable base of revenue. It doesn't need to define the entire market. Maybe it defines a portion of the market. Maybe that's how Medicare starts to reimburse for drugs that meet a certain kind of public health threshold. And then you have the private market being still reimbursed on a fee-for-service basis. That's going to provide some of the upside potentially to um, a novel innovation. But if you can provide that sort of stable revenue from a subscription model, that could be enough to try to create new incentives in this market. And I think that the opportunity is right to do that. I think you're starting to see the stars align in terms of policymakers and attention to this problem. Um, we tried to do it through, as you know, a demonstration with CMMI when I was at FDA. That was a very, um, I'm not saying it's not possible, but it was clunky. Uh, you know, having Congress step in to legislate is far cleaner and having Congress think through all the different issues and try to deal with some of the competing concerns, I think would be far more elegant than trying to do this through regulatory fiat. So I do hope that you know there is action this year. I know Senator Bennett has been leading this charge for a very long time, as well as some other members. So you know, I, I hope that we'll get something done. I'll pause there and uh, hope hope I didn't have too many breaks with my poor bandwidth. It's a, a, <laughs> a great overview of the issues that we're we're trying to cover, and I appreciate both the administrative approach which could potentially start with Medicare with some clunkiness, but there is some authority to, to, to take steps like this. Um, you see, it seems like you think the, the legislative outlook is better too. Well, I do. I, you know, I think that we're going to have uh, legislation that addresses pandemic, pandemic preparedness. I think this absolutely needs to be a part of um, that kind of uh, and that kind of bill. And I also think that we're going to have the reauthorization of the user fees. It's not too far away and something like this can get attached to that. There might be legislation also coming out of the Senate Finance Committee on drug pricing. And I think if, you know, the Senate Finance Committee and the Senate is going to contemplate, the House is going to contemplate doing something to try to put caps on uh, the ability to take price increases. I think coupling that with legislation um, and, you know, multiple pieces of legislation, but certainly this kind of a bill that provides some targeted incentives for areas where we think that there is underinvestment could be a very elegant alignment. Um, you take and you give, I think, trying to couple that within the same bill and it goes through the same committee. So um, I think that, that that's something that could be a vehicle as well. 
Scott, thanks very much for joining us this morning and laying out some issues that we'll be talking about for the remainder of the session. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Thanks. thanks Mark. Appreciate it. And uh, uh, now I'd like to turn to a conversation with Senator Bennett. Uh, he took the time to record this with us uh, just before today's event. We're very pleased to be joined today by Senator Michael Bennett for a conversation around issues uh, in addressing antimicrobial resistance. Uh, Senator Bennett has been a leader in the Senate from Colorado, where he's worked on a range of issues beyond biomedical innovation, including education, climate change, immigration, uh, health care, other aspects of national security. And before that, has a long history of working at the state and local level for uh, improving health care. Senator, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Mark. Appreciate well, it. Well, let me get right into our, our topic of, of the day, and that's on uh, dealing with antimicrobial resistance. Senator, obviously, we're continuing to deal with the coronavirus pandemic, but you've also announced a bipartisan effort in the HELP Committee to help prepare for future public health emergencies. How are you thinking about these topics, and, and uh, why, why bring this forward now? So, first of all, you're, Mark, totally right that we, we're, we're going to continue to deal with the current crisis uh, first. And I'm grateful for the leadership of President Biden and so many others, including yourself, who are doing everything uh, they can to bring us through this pandemic. And an important piece of unfinished business is implementing the American Rescue Plan, which contained tens of billions of dollars for testing and vaccines, PPE, and other public health needs. That's a bill that I worked on with Senator Gillibrand from New York, which we called the health force that would have invested funding for nearly a million public health jobs. The American Rescue Plan included 7.6 billion for 100,000 public health jobs. So that's about 10% of what we proposed. That's a good start, but there's a lot for us to do. So this funding will not only help with the workforce needs to get us through the pandemic, but also with capacity building. So the local public health networks uh, have the resources they need before a crisis hits. Beyond that, I think we need to take the lessons that we've learned from the past year and implement reforms and a federal response that won't be bogged down by politics. That's the health committee's bipartisan call. And this includes things like improved domestic manufacturing for PPE, diagnostics and vaccines. It could be through the strategic national uh, stockpile or through public-private partnerships. I remember the days of, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic of just the abject fear that people had when we discovered that not only was the uh, stockpile empty, but we had no capacity to make this stuff ourselves here in the United States. We've got to address that. We need to improve our data collection so we can understand in real time what's happening and help support local governments who are struggling to make that transition. And finally, I'm looking at what future pandemics might be, which is where antimicrobial resistance comes in. It's an issue that left unaddressed is going to become one of the leading causes of death in less than 10 years. And um, we've got to find a way in a bipartisan way uh, to get going on that. And it does seem like many of the steps that you described, uh, enhanced manufacturing capacity, better ability to bring diagnostics uh, for surveillance, monitoring to bear, better therapeutics, could have some bearing on preparedness for future um, in emerging infectious diseases, including this um, uh, worsening problem of antimicrobial resistance. Um, do you see your efforts here fitting into a, a global effort uh, with U.S. leadership to prevent and respond to these future infectious disease threats? I, I do. I absolutely do. Over the past year, I've had the chance to, to sit down with some of the small biotechnology firms in Colorado to hear about their work. And I am always impressed by how nimble they are and, and how they shifted their work to address COVID-19. Many began to develop innovative test treatments and ways to distribute the vaccine. And I'm so grateful that they, yeah, they're the ones that are driving innovation in our country and we get to benefit from that as well as the global community. And I'm, I'm glad we were able to lead on vaccines for COVID-19 globally. Uh, and I know there's already work being done to treat future viruses. So when it comes to antibiotics to treat drug resistant infections, however, the current development pipeline and innovative 
antibiotics on the market may not survive due to their inappropriate use in the healthcare system and a broken antibiotic business model. So in my view, two things need to happen. First, we've got to develop new antibiotics for when penicillins or other current antibiotics no longer work. Second, we need to recognize that when there is a crisis, the cost of the vaccine or the treatment matters. No one is paying for a COVID-19 vaccine today to get the vaccine, which is crucial to vaccinating as many people as possible. We need to look at funding models that allow for anyone to access antibiotics while also ensuring that the developers are earning enough to keep the doors open. Three novel antibiotic companies have shut down just in the past uh, two years. So one last quick thought on the global leadership part because it's really important to lead here. Senator Cardin and I, sent a letter to Gail Smith a few weeks ago, who's leading the vaccine diplomacy efforts at the State Department, asking the administration's plans on supporting the global vaccination effort. We are seeing significant needs in India, especially in Brazil is not doing well either. We, we need to make sure obviously that all Americans can get vaccinated, but we can't ignore the rest of the world. It's the right thing to do for the United States, you know, who's uniquely situated uh, to, to help and to lead. Well, I, I appreciate your comments there. And I hope uh, with, with your leadership, Senator, that we can see the, uh, the vaccines that are making such a difference in the United States uh, scale up and, and be distributed. You know, this is not the first time there's been a global public health crisis where uh, American innovation could make a difference. Uh, you were involved or you recall the, uh, the PEPFAR program uh, back in my days in the administration where um, after making sure that we had enough supply and its treatments for AIDS are being widely available in the U United States, um, the U.S. stepped up and helped contribute to a global effort to uh, really address AIDS in Africa. And I think it's another moment like that where hopefully through the kind of bipartisan approach that you're supporting uh, at the, the global level, um, we can bring the same kind of progress there. And, you know, you oh, emphasize... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might ask you, Mark, I mean, you're the expert on this, like what, what FDA and CMS have obviously, you know, the, their actions and response has been critical to, yeah. to authorizing paying for testing and vaccines. Given your experience and your vantage point, what kinds of reforms do you think we should be looking at? How do we, how well, do we make improvements? Well, you know, that actually leads me to one of your other proposals related to antimicrobial resistance. You know, what we've seen in the public health emergency is that we don't go to fee-for-service payments. This is, a, this is an infectious disease threat for an entire population. So that means models of payment and models of supporting innovation that focus on the whole populations uh, are much more important. With vaccines, it's been especially challenging because we need really large supplies to vaccinate everyone. With antimicrobial resistance, it's a little bit easier, but the same principle applies. They're the people who mainly benefit from having a antibiotic that's effective against a uh, resistant organism or all the people who never have to get treated because they don't get infected because we're able to contain it at the source. And that is absolutely a, a global problem. And, and to bring back, uh, Senator, to some of your leadership, you introduced the Pasteur Act during the 116th Congress. And that was really about moving away from, as you said, paying for um, antibiotics on a fee-for-service basis and paying more on the basis of what they mean for the whole population. So they can be there and be used uh, when they're needed and not used uh, excessively, like in the, the fee-for-service model. And that, that um, uh, the Pasteur Act, as you know, includes a substantial payment for companies that bring novel antibiotics to the, the market that can be used effectively against resistant infections. And I know we've been busy with lots of other things in the current Congress, but uh, do you think this is still an important step towards protecting Americans and creating this um, uh, global uh, response and preparedness capacity capacity in the, in the area of antimicrobial resistance? You know, I would say more important than ever, given our experience with with COVID, and 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 I really, I really do think it's critically important. So Senator Young uh, is a Republican from Indiana, and he and I wrote the Pastor Act. We're going to reintroduce the legislation and and make a push for its passage. I mentioned before that we need to look at the crises that that 
that we've been through to understand what's going to happen in the future, not just 10 years, not just next year, but 10 years from now. And infectious disease experts are all sounding the alarm on the need to support the development of antibiotics while also encouraging better stewardship of current antibiotics. And I think that the Pasteur Act is the strongest legislative proposal ever released to incentivize the development and, and, and improve the appropriate use of antibiotics in our healthcare system. And the way it works is that in return for receiving up to $3 billion in funding for antibiotic development, companies must enter into contracts with the government that include stewardship requirements. And these terms include everything from creating recommendations, supportive clinical guidelines, to education campaigns for providers and patients. We aim to make sure that doctors are not only using antibiotics when necessary, because overuse and underuse contribute to, to resistance, but additionally, as you mentioned, the government pays the company through a subscription and not based on volume, not a fee for service kind of regime. And this is gonna help unhelpful drug representatives from marketing. This is gonna help remove unhelpful drug representatives from marketing the product. And I think it's gonna help providers and even the manufacturers focused on what is best for the patient. So in this model, if a patient receives insurance through a federal health program like Medicare, they're, they will not have to pay for the drug, which helps remove a perverse financial incentive to use or not use the antibiotic unnecessarily. So to go back to the global aspect again, the world is taking a look at this proposal as one of the most important moves that the U.S. can take to reclaim global leadership in public health. So like us, they recognize that what we need to start preparing for an AM, AMR crisis now, antibiotics as you know, can take years to get through the FDA approval process. And once they do, we want to make sure they stay on the market, which, which is what the Pasteur Act will ensure. The UK and other European countries are trying to do this at a smaller scale, but they just don't have the resources that we do. So I hope this encourages the kind of value-based purchasing model that you, know, you mentioned, that both in the private sector, but also for other countries as well. Uh, Senator, that's a pretty comprehensive overview of not only the, the Pasteur Act, but how it can fit in as a critical part of addressing antimicrobial resistance in the U.S. and globally. Any other um, initiatives or, or um, uh, steps to address um, uh, antimicrobial resistance that the U.S. could take uh, that you'd like to add to that, um, to, to that description? Well, again, the Pasteur Act has millions of dollars that would support the appropriate use at hospitals and other providers. And this would help them integrate technologies that needed for better real-time reporting to the CDC and other systems. It also targets funding to smaller and rural hospitals and providers, which generally have less funding to do this work. And the proposal also incorporates a number of recommendations from President Obama's 2015 action plan to combat AMR, to improve data collection and report on and, and improve reporting on antibiotic use. I, the CDC just put out another report and we intend to incorporate some of the other recommendations that they've highlighted. But I am very optimistic that uh, as part of the bipartisan work that the health committee is doing later in the, in the year that this MA, AMR legislation, the Pasteur Act, uh, can be part of that and we can get it across the finish line and reassert our leadership uh, uh, in the world. Well, uh, Senator, I want to thank you for joining us. You know, we've seen so much progress happen in the past year in terms of vaccines being developed and be becoming available. The biggest challenge we're facing now is really this problem of scale and getting as effective therapies out to the world. In some ways, AMR is a bit easier than that. We don't need this volume of antibiotics that are effective if we can just manufacture them. We showed with uh, the new technologies that are coming along that we have the capacity to do that. And so I hope we can uh, build on your leadership, the steps that you're taking to, uh, to make that kind of progress, uh, just like we've made it to help get beyond the pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Really set up a good discussion for the rest of our panelists this afternoon. Afternoon. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to everybody. And I and I hope as we are working on this legislation, if you see things that don't make sense or where the emphasis you feel is wrong, let us know. We want to make sure that we get it right the first time. Uh, 
uh, so that uh, the kind of innovation that we all know is possible actually takes off. All right, well, we now uh, like to turn to our uh, next panel. Hopefully I get my video started again in a second. I uh, really appreciate the leadership from Senator Bennett, his uh, bipartisan colleagues and uh, uh, and staff involved in the uh, Pasteur Act and, and related issues. Um, and I do want to take up uh, his uh, question. We've already got a, Q &A, uh, a question about this. Uh, uh, we've, we've talked a lot about the, the next U.S. steps, but this is a global challenge and it's going to take a global response to address it. And in this session, we are going to turn to global policy leadership and proposals to combat antimicrobial resistance, continuing to, to build on the themes that we've discussed already. Uh, for this discussion, I'd like to welcome uh, Constance de Mateus, who's policy director at the Partnership to Fight Infectious Diseases. Uh, Lynn Flippy, who's senior global health officer at the Department of Health and Human Services. Silas Holland, head of communications at the AMR Action Fund. And Kevin Oderson, uh, an old friend of mine, a founder and executive director of, of Carbax and professor of law at Boston University. We've got limited time for this session, so I just want to remind the panelists that, that we want to hear from them and have uh, hopefully a little time for a discussion. Uh, and Candace, I'd like to, to start with you. Uh, uh, PFID has been doing a lot in this space um, based on the work that you've done already. Uh, what, what's next? Uh, what, what should Congress and the administration be doing? And, and how can we uh, uh, build on this uh, U.S. effort globally? Thank you so much for the question and for hosting this important discussion. And we're so thrilled to be a part of the panel. Uh, we <clears throat> launched last year with the intent to bring some different voices perhaps to the AMR issue, particularly from the chronic disease community and other stakeholders to really amplify the need to address antimicrobial resistance as a policy priority in the US and to, um, to position the U.S. more as a leader on the global stage as well. Uh, we work with and represent an active and engaged group, diverse partner organizations who are all galvanized around this issue. And just as collaboration is a key theme of our organization, we see that as a key theme moving forward in the U.S. and in the global response to this issue. We've done some polling here in the U.S. and people want policymakers to act to address AMR. Clearly COVID has made people acutely aware of the risks posed by infectious disease pathogens. And we know greater education and awareness is needed around AMR, but when people understand what is at stake, they want policymakers to work to address it and work collaboratively to address it. So we see that as an important part as it's been alluded to earlier as pandemic preparedness efforts. We're looking at what we can anticipate, what we can do better as a nation and certainly on the international stage as well to predict and um, prepare for future pandemics. Antimicrobial resistance is a crisis now and it's only growing. So it's an opportunity to act to stave it off. Um, we support the Pasteur Act and ultimately would like to see these different reimbursement models that de-link utilization from reimbursement as more the norm internationally as well. And the U.S. has a great opportunity here to be a leader on that front. We also support policy efforts that move us from recommendation to implementation as envisioned in the National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic Resistance and efforts that address other reimbursement issues, such as the Disarm Act, efforts around diagnostics are also important. We'd also like to see the US lead efforts uh, with other partner um, countries, countries of the willing, if you will, to work collaboratively on the financing issues that we've talked about. I saw we had a question in the box about that already. Yeah. Also focusing on appropriate use and stewardship and surveillance efforts that really can help us not just get a snapshot of what the true extent of the problem globally in the US and globally, but also help us to prepare and anticipate problems moving forward. We know it's not a problem that's gonna, not gonna go away without that concerted collaborative efforts. And so we look forward to continuing to work on this effort and work with our partners to help raise awareness and work with policymakers on workable solutions. 
Great. Uh, th thanks very much, Candice. And I appreciate your uh, building in some response to the uh, the top question in the in the Q&A right now from Colm Leonard and seconded at NICE and, and seconded by others about how to build this uh, global effort out uh, beyond what is going on in the United States. And uh, Silas, you may have some comments on that, too. I'd like to turn to you next. So the AMR Action Fund is already there and it's supporting uh, promising antibiotic development. Uh, but uh, you could talk about how that could fit with legislation like the Pasteur Act and similar subscription models uh, here and abroad to, to really change the, uh, the development outlook? Sure. No, thanks so much, Mark, and thanks for having me. So the AMR Action Fund is a, is a new initiative that was launched last, uh, last summer. And what it is, it's a new investment fund of about a billion dollars uh, that will invest in clinical development of novel antibiotics. And so it's funded by over 20 uh, large pharmaceutical companies, the Wellcome Trust, the European Investment Bank, and various philanthropies. And so the fund will make investments into clinical development uh, to support, to strengthen and accelerate the development of, of, of novel antibiotics, um, but also will provide technical support to these companies to ensure that these products are, you know, make it to market and are you know, in a, with as, as much data uh, and in as strong a position as possible. Beyond that, you know, the, the immediate first objective to bring these new antibiotics to market, uh, the fund is interested in being a part of policy discussions that really help facilitate some of this, um, some of these, uh, these proposals and pilots and, and try to expand it uh, to, to fix this, this market. <clears throat> I mean, we have a billion dollars to, to support this development and I think to support development and we think that, you know, that will keep some of the promising science you know that, that Kevin and others have supported in the early stages and really help keep that alive while policymakers are are uh, putting in place these kinds of new models for reimbursement and changes to pricing and really starting to value antibiotics more but ultimately it's not the AMR action fund is not the fix this is really just buying time for uh, for the more sustainable long term changes that that you know we've heard about from from Senator Bennett um, from uh, Commissioner Gottlieb really these are the kinds of things that will fix this um, and uh, and so the the Amor Action Fund is is a part of that to buy that time but ultimately we're going to really start to 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 need to see these this talk, as Candace mentioned, really translate into into concrete action. Great, uh, thanks. And the AMR Action Fund support in, in helping to develop and advance antibiotics uh, actually, I think, uh, complements a lot of the work that uh, the next person I'm referring to, uh, Kevin Alderson, has been doing through uh, CARBEX. So we have uh, a number of um, antibiotics, uh, Kevin, that, that uh, CARBEX has uh, supported um, through early clinical development. But CARBEX is also turning to and has also turned to these issues around uh, uh, getting those treatments to market and then keeping them on the market while used effectively. Can, can you talk a little bit about how things are looking from, from your standpoint, both in the United States and, and globally on these issues? Uh, thanks for inviting me, Mark. Carbex is global, and we have an amazing pipeline of preclinical and phase one products coming. Um, if uh, all of the groups that look at the clinical pipeline and the recent approvals usually come away a few charitable trust or WHO by saying that you know, it's, uh, it's thin or not particularly innovative. Uh, what we're supporting is a tremendously innovative, just do, more than a dozen, uh, 17 entirely new classes, uh, 34 therapeutics that are either new classes or uh, really non-traditional alternatives, things we've never seen before. A lot of innovation, but uh, just like what Silas said, uh, I don't think either CARBEX or the AMR Action Fund uh, are sufficient. Um, I've always been concerned from the first day uh, for more than a decade that we have to fix the market at the end. In addition to these excellent push incentives, uh, we need the market to be changed. And I love uh, what Senator Bennett said uh, about, you know, decoupling, delinking, ma making this based on value, not the volume. You know, I'm a law professor. If you paid lawyers by the word or by the hour, you're going to get more words and more hours, right? And uh, 
we need to be paying for antibiotics based on their value to society, not the number of people who take them. In fact, we want the CDC to do a, an, an amazing job and, and hospitals do an amazing job to drive that number as close to zero as possible, which would be great for public health, but a disaster for the little companies. And so at Carvex, the, the median size of the company we support has about 10 employees. Uh, these people are, are on a thin edge between what they're doing today, amazing globally relevant science and bankruptcy. And uh, we, we can't get around, you know, they, they need help and they need it immediately. And, uh, you know, what they're getting from us and what they can get from the Action Fund is a, is a bridge, but um, it's not a bridge if after FDA approval, they go bankrupt. So um, I, I think very, you know, it's critically important that we address these post-approval incentives, uh, like what the Pastor Act does and also what Disarm uh, tries to do. Uh, Kevin, thanks very much. I'm going to come back to some of these issues, but but right now I'd like to go to uh, Lynn, who has had a long day already, as we, as we discussed before this session, uh, those um, G7 uh, global negotiations, which are including some discussion around uh, antimicrobial resistance. Those are those are uh, in progress right now. Uh, Lynn, thanks for uh, joining us uh, on top of, of all of that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the current activities in the U.S. government to support these kinds of, of pool incentive um, uh, programs to moving away from fee-for-service uh, payment and uh, also any advice you've got about how uh, outside groups, including the other partners, including those that we're hearing from today, can, uh, can best work with the, the U.S. government strategy on these issues. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity, opportunity to be here despite the very early day because this is such an important topic. Um, and we do, we need all of our partners working on this issue. As you said, we need everyone's involvement if the US government's gonna move forward here. Um, I would like to just take a quick second to remind us though, why this has remained a priority for the US government for three administrations, just, and even now just, um, among, amid the COVID-19 pandemic. 2.8 million antibiotic resistant infections occur in the US every year, and 35,000 people die as a result. To make that a little more impactful for folks, that's uh, someone gets an antibiotic resistant infection every 11 seconds and every 15 minutes, someone dies. This is a high burden health issue for us. So in October of 2020, our Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria Task Force did release its second five-year action plan, and this will guide our actions through 2025. It continues to build on the successes of our first national action plan, um, and is still guided by the principles of our national strategy. And I think it goes without saying, it will need to be resourced in order to be implemented. Um, one of the areas where our outside partners are a, a huge assist. Um, R&D for new antibiotics, stewardship and surveillance remain priorities um, as part of the plan. But as we've seen with COVID-19, Surveillance, early detection, containment, having effective and accessible vaccines and therapeutics when needed is key to stopping the spread of infections and disease. And the United States is determined to be a better steward, not only for global public health, but for the antimicrobials that allow us to protect future generations from serious and avoidable losses. Um, we recognize that the US has to do this with our global community and we must scale up what we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, what we learned from our first national action plan, what we've learned from the efforts of those you've heard today, including Kevin and the work of Carbex, um, we need to take that forward and come up with new ideas and new action as well. And, and we're doing that. There's a few opportunities in particular right now um, with the G7 and TAFAR, but I do wanna stress that this, this does need to include everyone, G7, G20, international organizations and our AMR specific initiatives that are out there. So right now as part of the G7, the UK um, has several priorities and one of them is building back better from COVID-19 pandemic by leading a global economic recovery and strengthening, by leading a global economic recovery and strengthening resilience against future pandemics. And AMR clearly fits under that objective. We have had um, very thorough discussions among the G7 on how we can all move together on AMR. 
And as frustrating as it is, while there is global agreement that there is a problem, we still don't agree on how best to solve it. There are a lot of options. We don't have silver bullets. And so from the US perspective, it's time to move past looking for just one option for success and look for all the different ways that all the G7 countries and hopefully wider to the G20 can move forward on some of these issues too. How can we all individually look at reimbursement reform within our own systems? Too much from our perspective is on the shoulders of the US system. We need our global partners to get on board as well. And they are, but it's a little slow going. So um, additional help in, in talking to other countries is also always appreciated. The other place I wanna highlight that this work is going on is TATFAR. For those not familiar, that's the Transatlantic Task Force for Antimicrobial Resistance. And it's a partnership between the US, the EU, Canada, and Norway. We have a specific working group there that, that looks at poll incentives. And we are comparing and contrasting um, the, the models that are out there and looking for ways to find similarities and harmonizations and, and looking to get over the differences between our systems. So we are taking this work very seriously. It is ongoing. Um, again, no silver bullet yet, but we continue to look for progress and, and are really hopeful that this year the G7 can really move us forward. Great, Lynn. Uh, th thanks for covering so much ground. Actually, all of you uh, for covering so much ground concisely. We've got a, a good bit of time for further discussion. Some uh, great questions uh, coming in from our participants who um, actually bring that global perspective too. So let me stick with that for a minute. Uh, you talked about a multi-pronged approach here. And I know as we heard from our panelists, uh, uh, Kevin, Silas, others working on steps to help uh, push along some of the, the, the very promising uh, new types of um, uh, of antimicrobials, including uh, uh, building off of uh, very innovative platforms. Um, but there is a, a significant gap on the, the, the pull side. So maybe I could turn back to, I know Kevin, Silas, if you all wanna comment on, on your take on how this uh, global process uh, is coming together under the, as, as um, Lynn mentioned, with the UK leadership at the G7, this clearly is a priority. Um, what, are we, what, what else can we do to make the most of this opportunity? Kevin, Silas, want to comment? Yeah, I want to say the UK um, pilot is, is tremendous. Um, if it pays out at the expected higher And the value. UK pilot, just to expand a little bit on that, and we've got some uh, nice uh, participants in this, in this meeting too, uh, it's, it's around that kind of uh, subscription approach that we're talking about. Right. It, it's a instead of, you know, Pastor is a, is a bill that's proposed in Congress, the Senator Bennett and Senator Young are championing. Uh, in the United Kingdom, they've actually implemented a, a, a subscription model for two antibiotics. And while we don't know yet what the annual subscription payment will be, uh, it could be as high as $130 million over 10 years, which, um, you know, isn't enough to bring an antibiotic all the way through the market. But considering the percentage of the G20 economy that, that the United Kingdom is, um, that's, a, that's a very significant amount. You know, that if, if you, you know, characterize that out for the rest of the G20, if the other G20 countries proportionally um, had a subscription of equal amounts proportionate to what the UK is doing, then uh, you've, we've solved the problem globally. And so, um, you know, that's a very encouraging step um, with real leadership by the United Kingdom followed by um, Pasteur, which um, is a significant amount of money as well. Um, I'm, I'm very encouraged if we can get two out of the you know, seven members of the G7 to, to act in such a fashion, and then to coordinate with other members of the, of the wealthier countries of the world to follow suit. Um, that's an amazing step forward, but it requires legislative action leadership by the US, um, not leaving England hanging out there alone. Yeah, I would just add, you know, of course, this is a global problem that the U.S. Uh, can't solve alone. I mean, I, I would say that, you know, we need to see um, governments moving uh, and, and actually implementing these, these new models. Uh, and I think that will start to create some momentum and also some, some government to government um, uh, pressure. Because right now, you know, we have a lot of the G7 and G20 talking about doing things and we have pilots and proposals, but until those really start to get going in these different countries, um, yeah, I think that 
you know, we will not have a super huge amount of pressure on, on some of the, the skeptic countries. And so I think that the focus for a global incentive is really, you know, different countries implementing what works within their, their healthcare system. And the US and the UK have very different healthcare financing and healthcare delivery systems. And so of course it's not gonna look necessarily the same, but once they can move to that, then all of a sudden the US can start to say, okay, you know, we've taken action, we've put money on the table, we've changed. And so now France, Germany, Italy, Japan, you know, we're looking at you. And so it starts to be that kind of engagement versus this coalition of industry and academia and NGOs and civil society that are asking for action. Now it's a it's a much more a much bigger geopolitical issue. Yeah, uh, and then in the context of a global uh, pandemic, certainly uh, getting a lot more attention. Um, I do want to try to cover a few more important topics quickly that have come up in the questions. Uh, one of these uh, uh, set of questions relates to um, stewardship programs. And we've already talked about how fee-for-service payment for antibiotics really is at odds with getting the making the right antibiotics available when they're needed, but, but not encouraging uh, overuse. Uh, any of you all want to add to um, the, the initiatives underway um, that could help with this? Uh, clearly a move to more subscription type payments, not just for new antibiotics, but, uh, but more across the board could help. Uh, but uh, other thoughts? Pastor Act has a lot of money in it also for, to support stewardship. And a fully delinked subscription model you know, is, a, is just a beautiful way to, to reward the little companies without ever giving them any incentive to overmarket. Uh, we don't pay for fire departments based on a, how many fires they put out. Uh, we, uh, we hire them and train them and build fire stations and trucks, hoping that we're not gonna need them very much because we do an excellent job on fire prevention. So um, I'm a big fan of more money for CDC and stewardship and infection prevention and control efforts and vaccination. Uh, but we need the antibiotics as the safety net um, should those things fail. And, and indeed, you can build in uh, some attention to actually tracking uh, resistance, tracking appropriate use to these uh, payments, because as you said, they're tied not to volume, but to the value, the effective use of, uh, of antimicrobials. Uh, also, a few questions about where some of the new platforms, the new um, uh, uh, potential approaches to antimicrobial therapy fit in, such as uh, bacteriophages. And um, uh, Silas at the AMR um, uh, Fund, uh, uh, Kevin at Carbax, I know you all are interested in supporting not just traditional uh, antibiotics, but uh, uh, new models as well. Uh, if uh, either of you wanna comment on um, ways in which these new platforms can be advanced and if they fit into the models we've been discussing. Yeah, the AMR Action Fund is, is, is open to funding some of these non-traditional approaches, really focused on those that are antibacterial, including uh, bacteriophages. Um, but I think, you know, there, these are, uh, these non-traditional approaches really face a lot of the, the same challenges that, that small molecule antibiotics place, play, uh, face, and, and then some, you know, a much more complicated regulatory pathway, really challenges with, uh, with clinical practice um, and, uh, and, and the same kind of reimbursement barriers that we see for, for novel antibiotics. So I think there's some really interesting science that, that's out there and I think there will be a, a role for these, but uh, it's, it's definitely not a, a straight line. Kevin. Um, one other topic that's uh, come up uh, relates to developing the evidence needed on new antimicrobials. It's a challenge. Uh, uh, Vance uh, Foster asks about what, what else can we do to, to build more of a, uh, a platform, clinical trial platform. I guess I would add to that the importance of post-market data since many antibiotics generally come to market showing that they're at least as good as others on the market and you can learn more about them uh, uh, when they get into actual use. Um, uh, any comments on U.S. And, and global efforts to advance that those uh, evidence systems? That, so clinical trial networks and advancing those systems has also been a hot topic in the G7 this year. Um, we're still in negotiations, so I can't comment on what will come out of them, um, but they are, this is a huge problem and it is on everyone's mind, and, and we are 
along with the, we're supporting the UK and looking for ways to really push this forward. Yeah, it's been it's been nice to see in there. Sorry, the, nothing quite yet. <laughs> no, no, that that, that that's great. And I was just going to add that it's been um, impressive to see in the pandemic uh, some uh, international trial platforms coming together around uh, testing vaccines and uh, around testing other treatments. So uh, hopefully that too will provide some uh, some some added uh, mo momentum. Um, and if I, if I could just speak to that real quick. Um, that is something we have to take advantage of. Because of the pandemic, we do have more at attention and a conversation on sustainable financing for these systems. We can't just let them disappear once we're in recovery. We have to use them for antimicrobial resistance and a lot of other our other public health measures. And, and we are actively looking to do that. That is part of the conversation. So yes, while these clinical trial networks might be in response to COVID-19 and the immediate need, we do want to use them for, for other areas such as AMR. Yeah, um, so I wanted to broaden this discussion a bit. We've uh, gotten into a, a lot of important um, technical details about how uh, to address antimicrobial resistance and some of the specific initiatives that are moving forward here in the US and globally and how to advance them, how they fit together. Um, but Candace, I'd like to go back to, to you. Um, so a lot of this um, may seem like a bit of uh, inside baseball to, to the general public who um, I think got, do appreciate the, the, the growing uh, uh, prevalence of these serious infections and deaths are starting to impact uh, not just uh, 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 more Americans and, and their, their loved ones, but the kind of procedures people can get and, and uh, other aspects uh, of their health. Um, what else can we do to help uh, communicate effectively to uh, the broader public, especially in this time when people are paying attention to uh, uh, the, the threat of emerging infectious diseases? Uh, what else can we do to, to connect more broadly to the, the public about these issues? I think that's such a critically important question. And what we, one of the things we're doing, and I know a number of other organizations have done, is really driving home what is at stake. And it's, we have seen this year with the COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics, just amazing levels of innovation. And I think sometimes people may take that for granted, but when you have these unbelievable immune immunotherapies for cancer, but we can't cure the infection that, you know, may ultimately eliminate chemotherapy as an option. That's what we have to start communicating to people. And we are finding people and sharing their stories, you know, a common ear infection for a child that led to a two year, two year ordeal for the parents and the child, you know, a joint replacements that happen multiple times because they can't cure the infection that results. Drive really driving home the personal and patient impact and what's at stake for the medical procedures and common um, uh, things that we just assume we're gonna be able to handle, I think are so important to get people engaged and interested in the issue and driving for change. Great, Thank, thanks, Candace. And uh, more questions coming up. Uh, thank you all uh, very, very much uh, for for contributing these. And um, one, and I think Lana, maybe go to you to to close out this session. Um, a question about how uh, the World Health Organization and other global um, organizations can uh, and are collaborating on these efforts. Then, if you could also just uh, end out based on what you've heard today, any other uh, final uh, wishes that you'd like uh, these uh, uh, all of these uh, interested outside stakeholders stakeholders, uh, uh, partners to, to focus on as we move forward on, on trying to make global progress here. I think I'd like to, to reinforce what many of the other panelists have said. The US, we've been, a, we've been a leader in this area for a long time. This is a high burden issue for us. We have been an early supporter of the WHO taking on this work, um, but we have to do more. If we step up and show that we're willing to take action, the other countries will will go along with us as well. Um, and it, I'm really excited as, as an advisor who's worked on this for three administrations now, really excited to see this in front of the health committee and, and the attention that it's gaining there. Um, that, is, that is very encouraging. The, the federal government, the, the executive branch continues to take action with it, within our mandates and our authorities. We continue to look for the steps that we can take to make things better. But having that outside, having that other attention from our government is critically important. Um, as a federal employee, I can't lobby them. <laughs> so again, uh, partnerships with others is much appreciated. With our global partners and especially with WHO, 
Um, uh, you know, it's, it's really exciting to be re-engaged with them on this issue. Uh, they, within the last few years, they have a dedicated um, division for AMR now, uh, something that we were asking for for a long time. Um, and they are starting to promote some new initiatives. Um, I, I had given a, a written feedback, but they are working on something called Secure, which will also look for, for access and also looks to do what some of the things the US is already doing through BARDA and the NIH um, for, to, to bring in the wider global community. Um, so they have some work there. They continue to do excellent work with the CDC on stewardship. And that's critically important. If we, if we don't have good steward, stewardship, if we're not being good stewards of these drugs, there's no point in coming out with them. They'll be gone before we can even start using them. So um, we continue to work closely with the WHO, but not just with the WHO. This is a, a One Health issue. We work with FAO for food safety, OIE for veterinary health. These drugs that are critically important for humans are often critically important for animal health as well. And UNEP to bring in the environmental impact on human health and our impact on the environment. As I'm sure everyone's aware, climate change and environmental One Health issues is a huge uh, priority for this administration. And we're taking that very seriously in regards to AMR. So we look forward to doing more with, with all the international organizations on this issue. Great. Um, thanks very much, Lynn, uh, Kevin, Candace, Silas, for a, a very wide range and, and uh, concise, uh, up-to-date discussion. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to see all of the activities that you all are undertaking. And, and while these challenges of emerging infectious disease threats from infectious uh, from uh, resistant organisms are not new, uh, certainly a, a lot of um, uh, very important policy developments that could lead to uh, a big impact on, on this uh, um, in, infectious disease threat. So thank you all very much for joining us. And now I'd like to turn to our uh, next panel on innovations to combat AMR and emerging infectious diseases. So we've talked a lot about the policy steps, both in the U.S. and globally, that can potentially uh, make it easier to, to develop and bring uh, innovative treatments to market and encourage their effective use. Uh, but that's not the only thing that's changing now. And that's not the only new developments. Uh, uh, biomedical technology Technologies are progressing in many areas, especially with all the attention uh, on emerging infectious disease threats that come with, uh, with COVID-19, the importance of reliable supply chains and, and manufacturing and the like. So in this session, we'd like to turn to some of those innovations uh, around uh, diagnostics, around new therapeutics, as some of the uh, questions have, have already highlighted, uh, new types of therapeutics that can make a difference, and more reliable manufacturing, steps that could potentially bring down the cost and reduce the uncertainty of, of making these uh, new treatments uh, available. Uh, so for this session, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Alan Cockle, who's Senior Vice President for Public Policy at Civica, John Rex, Chief Medical Officer and Director, F2G Limited, and Operating Partner at uh, Advent life sciences. By the way, if you care about emerging infectious disease threats and antimicrobial resistance, get on uh, uh, John's uh, email list uh, to keep up with everything going on in this field. Uh, then uh, Michael Craig, Senior Advisor for Antibiotic Resistance and the Antibiotic Resistance Coordination and Strategy Unit at the CDC. Uh, and uh, Jason Burdett, who's Senior Vice President for Technical Operations at uh, Paratech Pharmaceuticals, which is living through uh, all of these uh, challenges that we've just been describing. So I uh, wanna hear some uh, opening comments from each of our panelists, and then hopefully we can do that concisely and have some good time for discussion, just like in the, the past session. And, and Michael, I'd like to start with a, a, a question for, for you. Um, so we saw early in the pandemic, some, uh, some, some time required, but a really big effort to uh, accelerate our uh, development of the capacity to rapidly diagnose COVID-19 and infectious uh, drug resistant infections it's not the same thing. They are spreading those we've talked about. And especially in light of all of the attention that's coming to stronger infectious disease surveillance systems, how are we doing and how can we do better in terms of uh, surveillance, uh, diagnostics, tracking of, uh, of antimicrobial resistance? Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you guys for having this session. And, and the, the question's a, an excellent one. And one that I would say, you know, goes back to, I think the, the heart of one of the lessons learned for COVID-19 that I think we need to take into consideration for antibiotic resistance. And that is that prevention is paramount. And prevention ultimately starts with detection and good data. 
and having a, a good sense of what the problem is and where that problem is going, and then figuring out what are the best prevention interventions to be able to address uh, that problem. And I, you know, I think ultimately, you know, there's a lot of discussion for AMR about the need for developing new drugs and new treatments that is fundamentally important, and we should never, you know, discount that in any way. But we also need to, to be clear that we're not going to be able to treat our way out of the resistance problem, that we have to use prevention tools, we have to have better diagnostics, we have to have better interventions like vaccines, better stewardship, better infection control to get us out of it. And I think ultimately, you know, what COVID-19 showed us is that a lack of investment in public health, not only in the United States, but around the globe, ultimately led to uh, this pandemic growing to a scale that, you know, has really gotten out of control. And I think we need greater investment on an ongoing basis in public health, in things like CDC programs, both domestically and abroad, so that we have the best data available and that we have the best prevention interventions available for any emerging infectious disease, but especially those that we appreciate the gravity of, like antibiotic resistance. Um, thanks very much. And I know we've gotten a couple of questions about um, more effective diagnostics too. So hopefully we'll have a chance to come back to, to that, uh, th these important topics further. Um, I'd like to turn now to Alan and to another aspect of preparedness and efficient uh, cost-effective response. And uh, Alan, uh, at, at Civica, you all are all about reliable uh, manufacturing capacity for, for critical uh, medical products. And in this context, I wanted to ask you about, uh, I know you've for long term been involved in, uh, in antimicrobial resistance issues too. Um, we're seeing more public support for making our domestic manufacturing capacity more robust, maybe building on some of the approaches that Civica has uh, implemented. Can you talk about any implications of that for um, antibiotic manufacturing that's more affordable? A lot of people don't realize how important uh, as how significant the manufacturing costs are for, for keeping uh, uh, an antimicrobial uh, on the market. And uh, I'd like to hear about uh, your thoughts from, from your perspective on how we can make that part of this challenge more efficient. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, Civic is a, a nonprofit drug maker that was really created by the US health systems to address drug shortages and, and improve resiliency of, of the supply chain. And you know, as we look at uh, where are the drugs where there have been uh, historical shortages, there are a lot of antibiotics on that list. So, so even pre-pandemic, there were problems in the antibiotic supply chain for the, for the generic antibiotics that are the, the bread and butter of, of medicine every day. And that's even setting aside the, the possibility of a future demand shock in a, in a type of pandemic that causes a lot of you know, secondary bacterial illness. Uh, Scott Gottlieb talked this morning about a slow moving pandemic of resistance, but you could also have a fast moving viral pandemic that causes a lot of bacterial illness and, and there's historical precedent for that. And so if you look at antibiotic supply chains, they sort of tick all the boxes um, and, and thinking in particular about penicillins and cephalosporins that are, are two thirds of the antibiotics we use every day in the US. Um, there are no facilities that make penicillin active ingredient or finished drug in the US, same with cephalosporins. Um, and in fact, we're heavily dependent on, on China for those APIs. Uh, and, and you can't repurpose other manufacturing facilities for those. They really have to be dedicated facilities because of, of the allergenic potential. And so if, if we want to uh, invest in resiliency, uh, you know, that's a place where it would make sense to have some U.S. capacity. But, but as you say, that's costly. And there's a reason that manufacturing has largely left the U.S. Uh, and, and frankly, it's probably not a commercially viable proposition uh, for any company, even a nonprofit, um, without some uh, government support of, of manufacturing uh, to, to bring back. And, and you know, we, we can do it in the US and, and in a sustainable, viable long-term business model, and, and frankly, one that has a, a lower environmental footprint than other parts of the world with, with that kind of investment. And it does seem like that approach and building on what Civic has done, which is moving away from, you know, sort of spot market prices to, to longer term contracts and accountability for reliable delivery um, could potentially help even new antibiotic um, manufacturer or antibiotic uh, developers coming to market by having some capacity that they can plug into. Yeah, it's, it's a great point, Mark. And it's, and it, it sort of, to my mind, solves two 
problems at once. If, if you're manufacturing a, a new innovator drug, volumes aren't small, hard to keep, or volumes aren't large, hard to keep an innovator facility busy all year round. So if you have, say, a cephalosporin, cephalosporin facility that's both doing the generic drugs that we use in reasonable volumes, but can also be a source for the, the innovator drugs, you're, you're sort of creating uh, or solving two problems at once. Um, and Jason, I wanted to, to continue on kind of a related topic uh, based on your experience at Paratech and a partnership with, with BARDA for uh, advanced um, uh, preparedness uh, uh, related to um, uh, uh, your products and uh, emerging infectious uh, resistance. Um, what kind of capacities, um, uh, what kind of um, domestic uh, um, investments would uh, help um, improve the ability to uh, develop and, and use products like yours? Certainly, and I'll build on what Alan was saying. Actually, it's, it's, it's a very, very good question. Um, so uh, first, I'll, I'll just mention that not one solution fits all in this space. You have uh, large companies that are producing and have their own manufacturing, but you also have a lot of small um, innovative um, startup companies in this space, which because being smaller um, and just building these products, um, we don't have uh, the, the means to be able to make these large investments to be able to produce for, for capacity um, when the demand doesn't exist, right? We would have to assure that idle capacity comes with a cost and a great cost to our actual, to our products. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the issue that we have is how do we uh, support being able to build the capacity before we actually need it um, and to be able to uh, have a different supply chain, they also can react to you know, surges in demand. It's a little different than, than when you can anticipate it and put it into um, you know, models and be able to anticipate demand over time. So we do have a collaboration with BARDA and BARDA has been extremely helpful and a great partner to be able to uh, support us moving the supply chain to the US. So we, that will be an additional supply chain um, that, that will be put in place. We've invested heavily in our supply chain in Europe uh, to be able to have reliability and sustainability. But the new supply chain that once we move it to the US, um, you know, we will build that surge capacity um, in to be able to react to, to, those, um, to that demand. To your question though, Mark, because I think it is a great one, where, where it would really help us is, is again, um, be able to find ways to be able to have these um, collaborations, if you will, modular manufacturing, um, certainly investing in capacity that can be used not by just one company, but by others. Um, one thing I think of in particular is for our product, it starts with fermentation. Uh, that fermentation is exclusively in, in Asia, right? It's, it's, it's not in the US. Um, and you know, we've, we've lost a lot of the, the knowledge and the know-how as well. Um, but in order for that investment to work, it certainly would be someone like Paratech that would be able to go in and, and make that large of an investment. The cost would be just too high. So where you can really help is to be able to continue to support um, and, and invest in, in helping us to be able to, to bring those things uh, to the U.S. Yeah, platform. I, I appreciate that. So I'd like to turn next to, to, to John Rex. And uh, John, I know you can comment on a lot of these topics, but I did want to, we have had a number of questions come up in, uh, about um, diagnostics in particular. And um, I know you've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about and working on the problem of difficulty of, of uh, rapid uh, diagnosis of resistant infections, especially in people who have life-threatening or potentially life-threatening infections and how that can lead to, to more use, uh, empir so-called empiric use of, uh, uh, of, uh, of antibiotics that we like to preserve for cases where we really know that we need them. Uh, uh, can you comment maybe particularly on that topic, but, but feel free to expand your comments around some of the other things you've heard today. Well, I'm going to start by just holding this up for a second. Uh, I, you I should have known have me, that we, we would get you this can't problem. can't have <laughs> me in a teleconference, a video conference that I don't <laughs> brought out the fact. A lot of what we've discussed in the last hour has been that antibiotics are the fire extinguishers of medicine. And for lack of a fire extinguisher for COVID, the world is on fire right now, right? So diagnostics. You know, the, the hard thing about diagnostics is that we have in our heads this image of the doctor in Star Trek, you know? 
Dr. Crusher or Dr. McCoy walks up to somebody and whips out this device and points at them and says, oh, you have Arturian Regalian fever, something, something. And the, the, this, and it's easy to envision that somehow a diagnostic is going to do that sort of all day for every infection that comes along. And the, the, the brutal truth is that it doesn't work that way other than under limited circumstances. The, the places where you can actually have the Star Trek doctor's tricorder device are, are in settings where the infection is something that is never, ever normal. So if I detect the DNA of tuberculosis in or around you, that's never normal. You've got a problem. You've got TB. I should be treating that. Ditto gonorrhea. So there are a few very specific things where the organism is the disease and the organism is never, ever, ever, ever normal in a human being. But the majority of the infections we're talking about, community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, urinary tract infections, just sort of the, the run of the day stuff that is numerically vastly larger, occurs due to bacteria that are living on us right now. You know, in one third of the noses and the people in this teleconference, you find the streptococcus pneumoniae. And when one of you develops a, a pneumonia this afternoon, and I do a PCR on your nose and I find the pneumococcus, is the pneumococcus causing your pneumonia? Maybe, maybe not. I have to go do something else to decide whether you've got the pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia or not. And that's what's frustrating. These commensal organisms, they're part of our microbiome. You don't want to make them go away. They're, make, they're doing good stuff for you. They're making vitamins, all this. You need your microbiome. You need the E. coli in your gut. And you need them to stay in your gut because when they get in your urine, that's when you get a UTI. But it is, it's, it's just not the case that a, that a super simple tool is going to be the thing that's going to constantly make the diagnosis. As a physician, you sometimes look at people, particularly when they're pretty sick and say, well, I think it's probably X, but I would be a fool if I didn't hedge my bets. And that's the other problem, the part of the diagnostic problem is that as a physician, unless you can tell me for sure what it is, I'm going to actually broaden it out. And, the, and most of the diagnostics, you know, if I run a test on you and say you don't have TB, well, that's good. Okay. I know you don't have TB because I didn't detect the DNA, piece, uh, the DNA of TB. But you could still have 10 other things. And I would, it would be foolish of me to ignore that possibility. You can often narrow down after a week or so, the dust is settled, you can figure things out. But diagnostics, I think, have an overrated power to, to fine tune therapy just because of the, the biologic speed limit of diagnostics. It's frustrating. It is frustrating. And maybe just sticking with the, the diagnostics theme, uh, maybe we could go back to, to Michael on this. Uh, we have some questions about whether um, additional, we've talked a lot about new models of financial support for developing uh, antimicrobials and some of the manufacturing supports that can bring down that, that cost and uncertainty uh, too for keeping them on the market. And then you come back to that. But on the diagnostic side, uh, Michael, any thoughts about um, uh, kind of parallel steps that would uh, uh, help address some of the, the, the diagnostic challenges that, um, uh, that, that John was just describing? And do you see any promise from some of the new diagnostic technologies that are emerging and, and making a difference in uh, more rapid and, and accurate diagnosis, including genetic subtypes for um, uh, in the COVID context. Yeah, so I think the, the parallel to the drug development side and the need to invest there on the diagnostic side, but also in some of the other ways, I think we need to approach AR like we have approached uh, COVID in terms of not just putting all of our eggs in one basket. We need to invest in the diagnostic side and make sure that we have incentives and are overcoming the challenges that we have there. We need to also invest in more of the prevention side in terms of the vaccine development. We need to be investing in vaccines for AR pathogens. And we have some very successful models for things like strep pneumo that have this twin impact of reducing the number of resistant infections we see and also reducing antibiotic use because you don't have to give someone an antibiotic when they're vaccinated against a pathogen. Um, and then also there are other things that I think have been touched on that I think we, all, we do need to clarify um, the regulatory pathway for preventatives like decolonizing things. John sort of alluded to this, that we have a complex microbiome and sometimes those things are commensal organisms that are not doing us any harm. And sometimes they, there are pathogens that are doing us harm. 
if we can come up with a way where we can have innovative treatments and innovative microbiome therapies where we can decolonize those pathogens from folks, um, we're going to have fewer infections and we're going to have more tools in our tool belt that are actually going to obviate the need for a bigger, uh, more treatments that, than, than necessary. We're gonna reduce the pressure on having um, more antibiotics that need to come to market by doing prevention today. Uh, thanks. And I want to come back, uh, and we don't have too much time left, but want to come back to some of the manufacturing issues. And we have some questions about that too. Um, I, and I think uh, uh, both um, uh, Jason and uh, Alan, you all touched on this. So there is clearly bipartisan interest in Congress in shoring up both the reliability of our manufacturing systems for uh, infectious disease threats um, and uh, support new kinds of um, uh, uh, manufacturing capacity, biologics, uh, other, you know, getting back to some of the earlier questions that we had about um, uh, phage uh, treatments and the like, uh, uh, systems that could support that. As you look at the congressional action, the proposals that are coming together on the manufacturing side, can you say a little bit more about how those might be um, uh, ad advanced in a way that, that simultaneously addresses these challenges around reliable, efficient um, uh, antimicrobial manufacturing, including for, for innovative types of products and especially for some of the smaller companies that Alan, to your point earlier, just you know don't have the scale to efficiently um, uh, manufacture on their own where these kinds of partnerships would really be helpful. I'll, I'll go first, but so there are a lot of uh, member bills, bipartisan bills, getting at the whole issue of supply chain resiliency and, and manufacturing capacity. And, you know, a few things that are, I think, uh, useful to single out. Um, one is, you know, some of them focus on advanced manufacturing and, and continuous manufacturing, which it has a lot of potential for small molecule drugs. As Jason talked about, you know, a lot of our, our core antibiotic scaffolds originate from fermentation, and, and that's not going to lend itself to continuous manufacturing at least not to make that initial scaffold. So that's a separate kind of investment. Um, but uh, you know, there is a bill, for example, from Senator Smith and, and, capacity, and, and Cassidy focusing on, on antibiotic manufacturing capacity there, which um, you know, I think some of the bills are not specific to antibiotics, but antibiotics would tick a lot of the boxes for priority criteria. That one's specific to antibiotics. Um, and, and then we could talk a little bit about the dollar value and, and the president has um, proposed, you know, big dollars to build up domestic manufacturing, um, you know, to, to create a whole new supply chain with API and finished drug. Of course, it depends on the, the product and the volume, but, you know, you're talking about hundreds of millions uh, for the API and, and for the fill finish and then the operating costs and, until you have a product that's, that's on the market. Um, in generating some revenue, and, and that's you know three years at a minimum. So we're we're going to have to invest um, adequate sums to to make this a, a reality, and 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 because of that, we'll have to choose our priorities wisely. And I would make the case that antibiotics should be on that list. Yeah, um, Jason, you know, your your thoughts on this uh, general topic? I, I I agree with all of Alan's comments. I think that there's a couple of problems that we're trying to solve. So. One is the, just the, the agility and the reactiveness um, for supply uh, for, for pandemics. And the other is, um, again, moving supply chains to the U.S. where we have less dependency on national and global events. So I think both of those things need to be addressed. So fermentation, um, as was already mentioned by Alan, is one of those things that I think that it's, it's really going to take an investment separately outside of, of what I've seen for, for these bills to be able to move that back into the U.S. Again, um, reducing our dependency on you know, unexpected um, you know, events globally. Um, we even saw, for example, during the pandemic where you know, there were embargoes that were put in place for certain materials um, that were, were being kept within the country. That's, that's something that you know, we, um, we really need to look to, to, again, have funding to be able to move that into the U.S. so that we're not uh, dependent on that. Yeah. 
It does, it does seem like uh, for um, innovative biomanufacturing processes like fermentation, and, and there are others involved in some of these uh, potential uh, innovative uh, types of, um, of antimicrobials that are in development, uh, having that capacity could be good both for preparedness uh, generally, uh, but also for, again, bringing down the costs and, and reducing the uncertainty of, uh, of getting uh, uh, promising new products to, to market. Um, we just have a few minutes left. And I, I want to make sure since this session is about looking forward and, and innovation opportunities, especially as Congress and the administration have put such a high priority on preparedness and, and re response for infectious disease threats. Uh, if there are any other key opportunities around supporting uh, innovation that, that you all see that we haven't touched on or haven't touched on enough. We've talked about diagnostics. We've talked about uh, uh, manufacturing. We've talked about new types of, uh, uh, of antimicrobials uh, in, in development. Uh, but any thoughts you'd like to add on these topics or, uh, or other ones? Uh, John, let me go to you first. So this marvelous conversation, let me go all the way back to Senator Bennett and the Pasteur Act. And one of the things the Pasteur Act talks about is there's going to be a, should be a, a reward for valuable antibiotics. And what it says in the Pasteur Act is, and a committee will meet and decide the, the features of that antibiotic and how much you'll earn. Will you get $750 million? Will you get $3 billion? And in the UK, the UK NHS has done the world is a fabulous service by working with the University of York to develop a schema for thinking about the values of antibiotics, and they, and they have published a point scoring scheme, that, and it and they used it actually to pick their drugs. So I, I think that a, a if you want to have the right drugs in ten years, ten years, you got to think about R and D as a ship that is about ten or fifteen years long. And the way that you move the ship is you tell the pilot where you want to go, and the way we're going to tell the pilot where we want them to go, go tell them what the point scoring system kind of looks like. And say, you know, you can pick a project that gets no points, or you can get a project that's going to earn a lot of points. Gee, pay attention. And so I want to see Pasteur make that go, take advantage of what the NHS has figured out, apply it to the, in the with the United States Pasteur Act, and get the rest of the world to sign up to setting concrete targets so that Kevin Otterson and the Carbex folks know what to start to on now that we'll have 15 years from now. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, Michael? Yeah, I think the other aspect that, you know, needs to be addressed here and that the previous panel brought it up is the global nature of the problem. I think we've talked a lot on this panel about the needs domestically, and I think those are critically important. We can't underestimate those, but the United States is not an island, and the, and the pandemic that we're a part of right now really illustrates the fact that some of these resistances are going to develop in other parts of the world. We've seen this countlessly with things like Canada Oris, which we didn't even know about a decade ago. And now it's causing incredible severe illness with high mortality in ICUs around the world, including in the United States. So what does that ultimately mean? Again, it goes back to better detection. And one thing I would highlight for you is that we have a cooperative agreement announcement out, not out right now from CDC to try to build a better uh, AR, AR data network so that we can get ahead of these things, we can detect them faster, we can get more information, and again, ultimately come back to prevention. How can we prevent and contain these so that when these resistances emerge, especially in places outside the United States, there is a response that seeks to contain that so that it does not spread globally, so that we do not have to worry and we only have sort of isolated pockets of these challenges that we can control much more effectively than when they sweep around the globe and they affect every country of the world. Yeah, and I'd say a, a lot of interest in these uh, early warning surveillance networks for viral infectious disease threats, and it does seem like a, a good way to, to a good opportunity to to, to build on that uh, that that interest and, and need. Uh, Alan, Jason, any other quick uh, final thoughts? I would just say, Mark, that all of your panelists today and, and probably many of our, our viewers have been working on this for, for many years. The, the level of attention now from policymakers on supply chains, on preparedness, on these questions is, is I think, unprecedented, and, uh, and we can't miss this moment. Jason, those, those are kind of good words to end on, but, uh, but you want to you add to them? No, 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 no. I support that. I don't have anything else to add. Thank you.
Okay, well, I, I would just like to add my thanks to all of you on this panel. Again, a wide ranging set of topics, but thanks for pulling them together into what can be, a, it seems like a pretty comprehensive path forward. And I appreciate Jason and others bringing us back to the global importance of these issues. You know, we're right now in the, uh, still in the midst of, uh, of dealing with the, the, the COVID crisis, and we're going to have to find some ways to work together even more effectively uh, globally to contain this pandemic uh, with all all the attention going on now in G7, uh, uh, G20, uh, around um, the issues of antimicrobial resistance and, uh, and better management of emerging um, uh, resistance generally through better diagnostics and early warning systems, through innovative platforms for uh, developing uh, new types of uh, antibiotics for uh, the supports for pulling these um, um, antibiotics to the market and creating incentives and, and supports for good surveillance and, and post-market evidence systems to encourage their appropriate use. Um, uh, John, I'm hoping uh, before too long you want to carry around that fire extinguisher at, uh, uh, at every event, um, but, uh, but really appreciate uh, all the interest in, from this group and from people who've been working on this for, for so long, and we've got a lot of them in our uh, among our participants and really appreciate the, the questions that have come in too. Um, at Duke Margolis, we're going to continue to support and collaborate uh, with all of these organizations that are making such a difference uh, on this topic with a particular focus on how to move the policies forward, uh, supporting policy analysis, uh, supporting efforts around uh, uh, bringing different groups together, both domestically and, and internationally. So please stay tuned. I, I mentioned some of the um, work that we've done recently on our website related to these uh, new models and, and new approaches to addressing um, antimicrobial resistance more efficiently and effectively. Uh, look for more of those to come. Um, and I want to thank all of our, not just our panelists, but all our participants for contributing so actively to this timely discussion. And uh, I would also like to thank our, our team at Duke Margolis, uh, Nicholas, Marianne, and John uh, for their work to pull this together. And thanks all of you in advance. You know, we're not done yet, but as you heard today, uh, this is a different time. It's a different time from the standpoint of public attention, different time from the standpoint of, uh, of congressional action, uh, of technology uh, possibilities. Uh, so looking forward to making more progress. And in the meantime, we, we hope you all have a great rest of the day. Take care.